Good, af good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cristian Ramos. I'm the policy director here at NDN uh, for the 21st Century Border Initiative. As you can see, we have a lot of people here with us today. I'm just going to give a very brief explanation of how the Spreecast works. I'm going to drop everyone off the screen, but don't worry, I'll bring them back on shortly to talk about our new report, Realizing the Full Value of Cross-Border Trade with Mexico. Just Okay, it's, uh, it's good to be with everyone today. Um, like I said, my name is Christian. I'm working with uh, NDN and the New Policy Institute. The report, as you can see, is actually displayed down there. That's a live link. You can press that at any time. If you want to ask any questions, there is a chat um, thing down here. Simon is actually chatting there as we speak. Feel free to interact with us at any time here. If you guys have any questions or anything, you can also use a comment or question button here. I'm going to just throw one up there real quick. This is how you ask a question on the screen. Question on screen. And I submitted that, and now it's going to go on the screen. There you go, everyone. This is how you ask a question on the screen. At any time, you can ask questions using that blue button. We also have the opportunity for people to ask video questions over here. So indicate that in your chat screen if you'd like to uh, jump on at the end when we take questions and answers. All right, so without further ado, I'm actually going to bring on Rick Van Schoik, who's going to be talking about the, uh, the paper and so on and so forth. He is the development director. No, he is the, I apologize. He is the director of Arizona State University's North American Center for Transborder Studies. And here comes Rick. There he is. Rick, can you hear us, everybody? Sure can. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chris John. Uh, the North American Center here at Arizona State University is very pleased to join NDN and actually a host of others as we think about the role of trade as an important component in the recovery of this recession as well as overall job and economic development. I noticed just this last month that the Council for Foreign Relations, the Wilson Institute, the U.S. Trade Representative, the American Legislative Exchange and others have issued uh, trade reports that are actually very similar to ours. Same message. I encourage you to read all of them. The trade system that we take for granted was built in response to and after the Great Recession. It was with the aspiration that larger markets enable our economy to grow. Indeed, as we have seen echoes of this very same mechanism in Germany's attempts to maintain its economy while uh, the euro to perpetuate its own trade with its neighbors. And this export balance to uh, Germany's and the EU's growth for over the last two decades. In the recent past, here in the United States, exports have been responsible for half of the growth of the GDP. And recognizing this, the Obama administration has pushed the National Export Initiative to double exports to three trillion by 2014. And they're well on track to achieve this. Uh, for example, in September, the most recent data that we have, NAFTA trade was up 13.8%, $77.7 billion. To make sense of trade with our neighbors, really, because they are actually growing faster than we are. Mexico's GDP is about 5%, and Canada is about 4%, ours is about 2 So it just makes sense to trade with them. But my real point is that NAFTA is really much more than just a joint uh, trading block. It's a joint production block. It's a joint or mutual prosperity block. Our very productive trade, due to our proximity with our neighbors, enables all of our products, all of our shared products, all of our joint production to be more competitive with the world market. What I want to make is that in a very real sense, when we talk about trade, we're also talking about security the security of other nations, but especially the United States during this recovery is, is based upon mutual jobs, mutual industry, and mutual overall economic development. Mexico's economy grew two to three times faster than ours, like I said. So hitching a section of our future to theirs just makes sense. They have perhaps one of the world's strongest growth 
in the middle class consumer section, not to me mention the overall demographic increase of the entire population of Mexico. But a larger security, a more enduring security, is enabled by increased trade, commerce, and exchange with Mexico. If regional security is measured in migration patterns, in reduced trafficking of illicit products, and increased foreign investment, the U.S. security is sustained by our overall involvement and economic ties with Mexico. I'm reminded of a quote that uh, uh, President Obama and Calderon said when they got together in March a, a year ago, and I, I quote it quite often because really it's true that our shared border must be an engine and not a brake for economic growth. So at this point, let me stop and thank and acknowledge uh, Eric Lee, the program manager and the, and the principal investigator and primary author of this uh, project. So with that, uh, please, Eric. All right, uh, thank you so much, Rick. I'm gonna bring Eric on. Just one second, everyone, while I do this. There he is, Eric. Why don't you say hello to everyone? Thanks very much, Christian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and, and thanks for that uh, lead-in, Rick. I wanna acknowledge your, your work on this report, as well as the work of uh, our research analyst, uh, Alejandro Figueroa, um, and thank uh, Simon and Christiane uh, uh, for, for uh, their uh, partnership and uh, their, their uh, uh, bringing us on today. Um, uh, the report I would also mention uh, is both on our website and in Dean's website. Our website is nacts.asu.edu. Uh, perhaps somebody can put that on in the chat area. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, trade is, between the U.S. and Mexico is often a topic that flies way under our radar here in the United States. Uh, it is not widely known that Mexico is our second uh, most significant trading partner, and unfortunately trade with Mexico is economic value that uh, is, for too many of us is hidden in plain sight. Uh, trade is uh, an intimidating topic for a lot of people. Just some general trade statistics to kind of give us an idea of where we are. Uh, a little over $2 trillion worth of trade moves in and out of the U.S. Uh, on an annual basis. Uh, according to the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, exports to foreign markets support uh, more than 10.3 million jobs in the United States. Uh, and uh, additionally, exports generated uh, half of U.S. economic growth uh, in 2010, 2010. So you can see that exports are a critical part of our nation's economy. Um, and as we come out of the Great Recession uh, and we try to uh, generate growth in our economy, it just makes sense to look at Mexico, our second most significant customer uh, 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 on the planet, uh, as, uh, as a great source of uh, development for our economy. Um, uh, one of the problems, however, is that we don't know Mexico very well. Mexico remains uh, quite exotic and unknown to many of us. Uh, for just some introductory uh, 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 words about Mexico, Mexico is a very large country, 113 million people. It uh, has economy, an economy that's uh, over a trillion dollars uh, in size now, and Mexico is the 12th largest economy in the world. Global development experts classify Mexico as a middle-income country. This is not a poor country uh, to the south of us. We need, to, we need to make sure that we understand that. Uh, Mexico is also a country with uh, quite modern infrastructure. Uh, in 2010, Mexico invested 5% uh, of its GDP in infrastructure, 76 seaports, 85 airports, over 16,000 miles of railroad, uh, well over 22,000 miles of roads. So Mexico is one of the most uh, interconnected countries uh, in our hemisphere. It's a member of the Group of 20, the G20. It has been since 1999. It's also a member of the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, and it has been since 1994. Next year, uh, by the way, Mexico will be chairing uh, the G20 beginning, uh, beginning next month. Uh, and it's also important for us to understand that Mexico is a member of uh, uh, the next set of big emerging economies uh, 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 in the world. 
Uh, it's following closely on the heels of the BRIC countries. That are, those are, of course, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, and these emerging countries, uh, these emerging economies are, various, are known by various acronyms. Uh, lots of acronyms out there. One is the MIST countries, Mexico, Indonesia, South Korea, and Turkey. Or, uh, according to Foreign Policy Magazine last week, uh, we came up with a new acronym, the TIMBIs, Turkey, India, Mexico, Brazil, and Indonesia. Whichever acronym we use, uh, it's important to know that Mexico is uh, an, an extremely important emerging economy and uh, uh, just by our good luck, right next door. Uh, Mexico is also, Mexico's economy is also growing faster than our, than our own economy here. In 2010, Mexico's economy grew uh, by 5.4%. It was just going through the roof that year as the U.S. economy uh, took off, uh, emerged uh, somewhat from the, from the Great Recession. Uh, after that uh, recovery uh, cooled down a bit this year, we're right around 4% uh, or so right now. Uh, just a few words on bilateral trade with Mexico. Mexico is now the third ranked commercial partner uh, of the United States. That's in total trade, exports, and imports uh, behind, Mexico ranks just behind Canada and China. Uh, and since the implementation of the North America Free Trade Agreement in 1994, uh, bilateral trade between the U.S. and Mexico is now at $400 billion a year. It reached $400 billion a year, a record level in 2010. Uh, Mexico, again, we can't say this enough, Mexico is the second largest export uh, market for the United States. Um, in 2010, Mexico spent $163 billion on U.S. goods, with, which was about a $35 billion increase over the previous year. To, to put this another way, U.S. exports to Mexico are larger than all U.S. exports to Brazil, Russia, India, and China combined. To put this yet another way, we export more to Mexico than we export to Great Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands combined. Uh, so it's really quite impressive, this uh, trading relationship. Uh, the, the last, uh, one of the last points I want to drive home here is that trade with Mexico and also with Canada is fundamentally different from trade with our other partners. Uh, what, if you did the math uh, during those, over the past two minutes, you, you saw that we do have a trade imbalance with Mexico, but as, as uh, uh, experts on this topic know, there are trade imbalances and then there are trade imbalances. Uh, for every dollar Mexico makes from exporting to the U.S., it will in turn spend 50 cents on U.S. products or services. That is an enormous difference uh, with China, for example, which spends only about four cents or so. Uh, uh, for every dollar it, uh, it's, it uh, uh, makes on sales to the U.S. Um, our colleague Christopher Wilson at the Mexico Institute there in D.C. Uh, has a great new book uh, on Mexico, U.S.-Mexico trade coming out next week called Working Together. And Chris makes the point that Mexican imports uh, to the U.S. contain 10 times more U.S. content than their Chinese equivalent. So we see right there the intensity of this economic uh, exchange. Uh, by the way, what does Mexico buy from us? Mexico buys an enormous uh, a, a variety of goods from us. These include uh, computer and electronics, uh, transportation equipment, chemicals, electrical equipment and appliances, and even, interestingly enough, agricultural products. We have ag coming north into the U.S. We also have ag going south into Mexico. Uh, the last point I'd like to make, uh, it is maybe one of the most important, is that trade with Mexico sustains supports 6 million jobs in the United States. That is an enormous number of jobs. Trade with Canada, by the way, sustains about 8 million U.S. jobs. So it's really important uh, from our perspective uh, to focus on this trading relationship, uh, particularly as we try to export our way out of uh, the Great uh, Recession. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things about this map behind me here. Uh, this is a map that was developed by the Economics Ministry uh, of Mexico. It's called U.S.-Mexico Economic Relations. Job creation starts with trade. Basically, I would encourage everyone uh, to take a, uh, a good look at this map. I'm just showing the eastern half of the United States right now. But this map basically breaks down trade with Mexico by state. So total two-way trade. Uh, jobs supported uh, in each state by trade with Mexico, as well as the main products. Uh, some of the numbers are, are just astounding. 
Uh, Texas, for example, has $113 billion of two-way trade with Mexico. Uh, there's over 230,000 jobs in Arizona uh, that are sustained by trade with Mexico. And it just goes on and on. We have a copy of this uh, on our website. And uh, NAFTA Works also has a copy uh, uh, on uh, the Secretaria de Economía's website. Uh, in our report, we, we do touch on uh, U.S.-Mexico border management. Uh, I won't go uh, into too much detail here other than to say that uh, for the last several years, the U.S. and Mexican federal governments have been working together to develop uh, joint border master plans in the different regions uh, of the, of the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. Uh, this is uh, important collaboration that will help with the enormous uh, infrastructure deficit that our two countries have uh, at our land ports of entry. Um, other than that, uh, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, I hope we've painted a picture, that Rick and I have painted a picture for you uh, in our attempt to encourage a broader conversation on how to realize the full value of uh, this critical commercial relationship uh, for the U.S. Um, and thanks again for your time. We encourage you to dig into the report and get back to us with questions and comments and suggestions. And again, that report is available on our website and also Indian website. Christian Ramos will now tell us how you can participate in the discussion uh, in this precast. All right. Before we get there, though, I just want to bring on uh, one more person, Simon Rosenberg, a man near and dear to my heart, also my boss, uh, but also somebody, an expert on the border in his own right. So here's Simon. He's up on the screen. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Thanks, Christian. And I really want to thank Rick and, and Eric for uh, their terrific work, and Alejandro, too. We're proud to partner with uh, ASU and the center. Uh, it's uh, been a great partnership. Hopefully, it will lead to many more things in the future. I want to be very brief because we want to get to uh, conversation, but I want to just give some context to the work that our 21st century border uh, initiative has been doing and why this paper is so important for us. I mean, we, we're based in Washington and we're interacting with federal policymakers in the, in the administration and in Congress. And what's been striking to us in the years of work we've done on immigration and other matters is just the, uh, the ignorance, frankly, or the lack of understanding of, of the nature of this relationship that we have with Mexico today. You know, Arturo Saracan, the extraordinarily able ambassador from Mexico to the United States, often says that Americans don't know it, but the relationship with Mexico may be our most important uh, bilateral relationship in the world. And, you know, if you think about a few things, I mean, not only is Mexico now our second largest export market or third largest trading partner, uh, we share a 2,000 mile common border, uh, the largest and busiest border crossing, land border crossing in the world. Uh, is in Otea Mesa and San Diego. We also know that for the U.S. that 10 percent of our domestic population is now of Mexican descent uh, and 20 percent of all the Mexicans alive in the world live in the United States. And what it means is that this neighbor, this partner of ours, Mexico, uh, is going to become more central to who we are and what we're about in the 21st century as our two countries grow closer together economically, culturally, uh, and uh, and in all in all ways. I mean, if you think about it, just taking a step back. I mean, what I'd like to say sometimes is that as someone who lives in the East Coast, for most of our history, America has really imagined itself as a place sort of west of Europe. But increasingly, in the 21st century, we're going to also be east of Asia and north of Latin America. And the our you know our large growing Latin population, if you exclude Brazil, makes us the second largest. Uh, Latin country in all of the Americas. Our identity is going to be increasingly Latin as we move into the 21st century, which is going to make this relationship with Mexico central to who we are and what we're about uh, as, a, as a people. So we're proud to be working with our partners at ASU, with our friends in the Mexican government, with many uh, allies and friends in Congress uh, and in the administration, and also in the border network that we've established and that uh, in, that is connected to our 21st century border project, who are working so hard to tell a different story. Because most of the stories that we hear about Mexico in the national media are not so positive and not so favorable. Who would have known? I mean, I give talks about this all the time, and people don't believe me when I say that we trade more today with Mexico than we do with the UK, Germany, and Japan combined, given the amount of attention, for example, that the Eurozone crisis is having right now 
you know, our trading relationship with Mexico is of equal economic import in many ways to almost that entire relationship. And yet, disproportionately in the media, right, we understand how much attention is being given to the Eurozone and how little attention is being given to the centrality of this economic relationship that's developed in the post-NAFTA era uh, with Mexico. Finally, my final point is, as somebody who worked to pass NAFTA in 1993, working along with Bill Daly and, and many others, the current chief of staff in the White House, you know, it is clear that NAFTA has worked. Uh, it is not perfect. There are many more things we've got to do. We referenced some of them in the report. Clearly, much more has to be done to curtail the, the violence on the Mexican side of the border. Uh, but there has been tremendous progress made. The relationship between the U.S. and Mexico today is deeper and more profound than it has perhaps ever been in the history of the two countries. Uh, a lot of good things are happening here, and I think this, is, this project is, a, is an effort to help celebrate them and to start thinking strategically about what we can do to continue to advance this economic relationship and deepen the cultural relations between our two countries. So thanks so much, everybody. Christian, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. All right, now we are going to take questions, and I see that we have a couple of people who would like to ask questions via video, but I'm going to take this off the screen for the moment, and the first person, so there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can submit a comment and question, and then I can accept it, and I can put it on the screen like so, but as an added benefit, I can also add a spreecaster. In this case, that is uh, Akosh out there in Nogales, Arizona. He's a little fuzzy out there, but I think his sound is up. I'm going to bring up um, Eric. Do you want to? Let me see. Eric, do you want to take this question? Is this one work for you or Akosh? Can you talk? I can talk. Eric, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Ask away. You. Hi. Uh, good morning, Eric. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I loved going through it. Uh, I do have a couple of comments. I was wondering uh, why the international crossings at Douglas and Naco weren't represented in part of the report. Yeah, good, good question. This report uh, was basically an introduction to some basic concepts behind U.S.-Mexico trade. As you know, there are over 40 uh, port, land ports of entry between the U.S. and Mexico. The Douglas Crossing is definitely uh, a key one here in Arizona and for the, the two countries together. Uh, I, we hope to do more on uh, individual ports of entry in, uh, in, in future reports, definitely. Thank you. Are you aware? Okay, I'm going to bring back uh, all of our panelists now, and then I'm going to put up a, another question. And so let me just get Simon back up here, and there's Rick. And then the next question slash comment comes from Christopher Wilson, and he says, well, everybody can read that, but I'm just going to read it out loud. Thanks so much to all of you for creating such a phenomenal report. It seems to me that one of the main challenges facing North America today is finding ways to effectively compete with China and the rest of Asia. What are the most important steps we can take, especially at a regional level, to manufacture products that can compete with goods produced Chris, in Asia? Chris, I couldn't agree more Who wants with to you. Take a stab I, at this uh, one. Would have to say that uh, President Obama would agree with you as well, and I think that it's important to remember that right after Hawaii at the North American Leaders Summit, he headed off to Asia to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership because indeed the ability of North American products to compete against uh, those from anywhere in the world uh, is, is high. And he went after consulting with uh, the leaders from Mexico and Canada as well. So I, I think that it's an important point that we need to remember that uh, North America can be as important a manufacturer and an exporter of products as any country or block in the world. Oh. Okay, okay, that's uh, that sounds good. We've got another question. This one's for Simon Rosenberg. I'm going to bring him back 
up on the screen and here we have JD Bryant. JD, go ahead and ask. Your Thanks. Hey, right, so so uh, some politicians have uh, tried to tell us that the U.S.-Mexico border is out of control. And I was just wondering what your take is on how that affects, how that kind of rhetoric affects our trade relationship with Mexico. Well, I, I think that, you know, to be fair, if you look at the, the data, I mean, what's been since... Well, let me take one step back. In the spring of 2010, President Calderon visited the United States, and our two presidents signed a joint declaration for the 21st century border. And the way I describe that, it was a vision for how our border region should develop over time, which wanted to see more good things get through, trade and legal traffic, uh, you know, people crossing, but fewer bad things, fewer smuggled guns and uh, bulk cash and illegal migrants and, and, uh, and drugs, obviously. And I think that this is, this is, I think this has been very successful. It was a smart strategy, and I think it's been very successful. We've seen trade continue to increase. We've seen all the interdictions of all the bad things increase. We've seen a significant drop in the amount of, uh, there's been a lot of press in the last couple of weeks about the significant drop that's happened of illegal migrants uh, coming into the United States from Mexico. But most importantly is that despite the impression of violence, the uh, cities on the U.S. side of the border are among the safest cities in all of, uh, of the United States. That with a, and so you have a city like El Paso, Texas, right across from the border of Ciudad Juarez, a very dangerous city. El Paso, Texas is the safest city of its size of any city in the United States. And so those people, I think, who are arguing that the border is unsafe, it may be not so safe on the Mexican side. It's very safe on the U.S. side. And, and so part of the message we want to deliver is the border is really open for business. I mean, we have, you know, despite all of the perception of violence, trade has continued to increase. But what has suffered, and we work a lot with the mayors and the sheriffs in the border region, and who can, you can hear themselves talk about all this on our YouTube site that you can find in our, in our basket of, uh, of sites related to this project, is that the perception of violence and the exploitation of this by certain politicians has definitely hurt the regional economies on the U.S. side of the border. And so part of the story we're trying to say is that things are safer, the border is safer today than it was, trade is increasing, the, the administration and, and the previous administration have made tremendous strides uh, in improving this area. There's much more to do, though, and that's part of the reason we've, uh, we've adopted this, that we've written this report with ASU, uh, because there is much, as much as there's been progress made, there's much more to do. Eric, Rick, you guys want to jump in? Anything you want to add to that? Go ahead, Rick. I would add that the reality on the border is uh, significantly different from the way that people perceive it in Washington. And I was uh, especially pleased to read a report by the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress just yesterday that reiterated that regardless of how violent, corrupt, uh, uh, criminal uh, dominated uh, the streets of Juarez used to be, El Paso remains uh, probably the safest city of its size in the country. I think the statistic a couple years ago was they had uh, three murders or, and one was a murder-suicide. So it, uh, it's a uh, uh, phenomena that uh, confounds those of us who actually know and live on the border. It's, it's safe and, and uh, uh, I'd have to say that Mexico is safe as well. I mean, at least it is for, for me to go down there and travel. Yeah, I, I'd just say that, uh, just to reiterate what Rick said, from our standpoint, the uh, U.S. side of the border uh, continues to be very, very safe, uh, particularly in the urban areas. Uh, on the Mexican side, it's interesting to see how, how quickly the, the security situation changes on the Mexican side, particularly with the... Uh, 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 efforts of the Mexican federal government in places like Ciudad Juarez and, uh, and Tamaulipas, which have now uh, really calmed down quite a bit uh, over the past several months. Uh, uh, from uh, and, and, and we travel to these places all the time, and, and, and we have lots of partners there, and, and we know this to, to be the case. But the, on the Mexican side, it, it, it changes uh, quite a bit. On the U.S. side, it continues to be very safe. 
Okay, we have um, another question from Jack Evans here, and I'm going to throw that on the board, and you guys go ahead and uh, ask away. Here you go. So um, everyone can read that. I don't know if anybody else wants me to read these things out loud anymore, but Rick, Eric, how do you guys feel on this? There has been a uh, joint pilot project uh, between the United States and Mexico for the last uh, several months. And uh, based upon both uh, the safety reports and the, uh, the language uh, uh, ability of the drivers, etc., there's a program right now. But I think, uh, like so many of the other projects, we need to make sure that these things remain permanent. It's just crazy for us to watch what we call the empty miles, the uh, trucks that are empty as they not only return from their destination in the United States, but cross the border empty, sometimes waiting for quite a while to get back into uh, to Mexico. It does make sense to fill up those trucks going both directions. So the ability of NAFTA trucks to make uh, North American trade more productive is, is undeniable. And the safety has been affirmed, and uh, the ability of the drivers to uh, be effective, safe drivers is affirmed. So we'd like to see continued efforts by Congress to uh, appropriate and indeed approve this uh, pilot project that is uh, working very effectively between the two countries after, I'll have to admit, this 15-year delay of getting uh, NAFTA trucks uh, approved. All right, guys. Uh, Eric, if you want to follow up with that. If not, we have another video question. Um, Eric, do you have any comments or Simon? Right. The, the pilot program uh, came online uh, in October of this year, and uh, the countervailing tariffs uh, should have been lifted uh, by now. So we are at the beginning of this program, and our center will be watching it uh, very closely. All right. Uh, Simon, I'm going to bring on uh, our next question, and it comes from Alejandro Figueroa. I'm going to throw him on, and I'm going to come off. Everybody, uh... thank you. This question will be for Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, I visited your website a couple of times and your YouTube channel. I viewed most of the interviews you've done, but I want to get a feeling of what your uh, uh, idea of the border region is status is at this point. In terms, uh, Alejandro, be a little bit more specific. The, the, our take on what's the status in the border region economically, politically, what's your... I would say economically. Be, be more clear. The economy of the EFD. Look, I mean, we, we've been uh, fortunate enough through the project uh, that we are operating, and I want to also thank the Ford Foundation for having been a major uh, funder of the work that we've done. Is that we've been we've brought up more than 50 mayors and sheriffs um, to uh, to Washington in the last year and a half to come meet with administration officials, people in Congress. We've held press events for them to tell us. I mean, that's not it's I all that I know. I've learned from people who are much closer in the front lines as I'm based in, in Washington, D.C., um, is that, you know, what we hear is that the perception of violence that is being um, uh, portrayed by, uh, by often by politicians uh, in competitive elections and so on in the, in the border states uh, has created a national impression that the U.S. side of the border is unsafe. And there's just no question that that has dried up tourism uh, in the region, that, that direct investment or foreign direct investment and U.S. investment uh, has uh, decreased, that some of the border communities have seen, uh, you know, are suffering, even, in, 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 even as bad as the overall economy is, right? They've disproportionately suffered because of this perception of violence. Shoppers from Mexico haven't traveled as much over the border. Some of that is also wait times, right? We know that part of what Eric and Rick have been talking about is that the infrastructure that we have, the current port of entry infrastructure we have is simply inadequate to deal with the level of trade and commerce that is taking place today, let alone where it will be 10, 15, 20 years from now. And so I think that part of our goal here is to really help elevate up this 
idea of the 21st century border, uh, where more good things get through and fewer bad things get through, to make it a national issue, to make it something that is debated in the presidential debate in the presidential campaign next year, that is something that is understood and common and not remote and, and distant from uh, the, the national conversation, because certainly this economic relationship between us and Mexico has become one of the most important economic relationships America has with any country in the world. And culturally, you know, getting this right is not only critical for people of Mexican descent here in the United States, but as, as we look to expand our markets throughout all of Latin America, how we manage both, I think, our, the domestic challenge of immigration reform in the U.S. and the way that we handle the border region itself will become an important signal for how we look, how we are treating the rest of Latin America in the 21st century. We got to get this right. And I want to applaud the work of ASU and Rick and Eric for having helped been leaders in really trying to how to reimagine a national strategy for the U.S. We can do this better than we're doing. And, we got, and we've got to get to work. So I think a lot of progress has been made, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. All right, so we've got uh, one more question here. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. And um, who wants to take this one? Maybe raise your hand or chime in at any time. Eric? Go ahead, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, take it away. Let me, let me uh, jump. Hey, Christian, can I just give a quick answer to that? Because I, I, I have strong feelings about the, the question is that, and I'm going to, because I don't hold elected office, I'm, I'm going to say something perhaps provocative, which is that I, I don't think that making the border secure should be actually be a goal of the U.S. And the reason why is that we don't want a secure border. We don't want a lockdown border. We don't want a border where nothing gets through. We want a safe border. That's a dynamic border. We want something different than a secure border, uh, I think. I think something that's more nuanced and more complex. We want a border that is a 21st century border where more good things are getting through and fewer bad things are getting through. I think that's what our two countries are trying to do right now. And I think they've made tremendous progress. And I think that those politicians in the US who are creating this sort of you know, unrealistic set of expectations about what is possible uh, or desirable in the border region need to be challenged. And, and, I, and I think that's one of the reasons that we're, we're doing this project, because I think that there's just been an enormous amount of um, misinformation spread uh, about what is really going on between our two countries in the region. And we've got a lot of work to do to tell a better story. I, I do want to recommend for anyone who's watching that there have been several important speeches by the current government. Uh, Janet Napolitano, gave a speech in El Paso in January that is very much worth reading. Barack Obama gave a similar speech in El Paso in, in May, which is very much worth uh, reading if you want to learn more about this. Secretary Napolitano just gave a speech about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, at an American university about what was happening along the border that was very much worth reading. And I would certainly rely more on them than I would some of the folks that we see on some of the cable news shows uh, about what's taking place in the region. All right, so our next question comes from uh, Jack Evans, and I'm throwing it up on the screen. Uh, Eric, Rick, if you guys want to jump in and wait in on this one. Eric, I think that's uh, coming to you, buddy. Sure, sure. Uh, 
Mexico's maquiladora uh, industry is as healthy as it's ever been, interestingly enough. There were concerns uh, right after China uh, uh, joined the WTO in the earlier part of the last decade that uh, everyone would, everyone uh, in Ciudad Juarez, uh, uh, Agua Prieta, Nogales would pick up and move to, uh, move to China. That most definitely did not happen and that is because uh, there are huge advantages, uh, supply chain advantages to producing uh, in Mexico. For one thing, uh, those goods are not on a boat for several weeks at a time. Those goods are produced in Ciudad Juarez, uh, as I said, Nogales, uh, Tijuana, and uh, in sometimes in less than 24 hours they're across the border and on a plane, a, a FedEx, a UPS plane, uh, to wherever they need to get to in the United States. So um, uh, the security uh, situation has affected uh, commerce in Mexico at the margins. Uh, I, I don't think there's compelling evidence that at all that it has uh, really, really hurt the Mexican economy. Uh, uh, the, the downturn in the Mexican economy in 2009 was as much due to uh, the U.S. economy's downturn as anything else. All right. Uh, does anybody else want to weigh in on this, or are we ready for the next question? Okay, here comes the next one, putting it up on the screen. This one comes from Jonathan uh, Alanis, and um, I believe it touches a bit on Fast and the Furious, drug agents, laundering money to cartels. I think I'm going to give this one to Simon Rosenberg. Please, take it away, Simon. And Eric, you guys are certainly welcome to uh, pile on or jump in after I'm, I'm done here. I, I, I will be very brief about this, is that, I, you know, we have been, sorry, uh, we're still learning how to use these systems here. I just got a phone call from a friend of mine. Um, you know, I, I think what's been uh, amazing about the congressional, uh, well, let me say this. I am heartened that Congress has shown so much interest in recent months in the issue of gun smuggling into Mexico and uh, our attempts to combat the cartels. I think a generous way of describing what's happened um, in Congress over the last six months is that we've now seen more attention to our national strategy to stop the illegal gun flow from the United States, which is you know, central to destabilizing you know, parts of Mexico uh, to the aggressive tactics this administration and the previous administration have used to try to combat the cartel uh, violence is that I think part of what's being exposed here is that our government is trying really hard uh, <laughs> to be creative, innovative, uh, to tackle what is a very real problem of cartel violence and frankly our own culpability in helping foster and create some of that violence through you know very lax uh, gun laws that are being exploited by the cartels uh, in in the United States, and I and I think that what will, to me, whatever happens with Secretary, I mean, with Attorney General Holder, uh, and now with this this coverage of the DEA stuff, what we're what we're beginning to have is a real conversation about what is our strategy, what can we be doing better, what's working, what isn't working, and I and I think we welcome that. I think some of the efforts to um, demagogue. I, I want to congratulate Secretary. I mean, Attorney General Holder, for having turned uh, what was a, an inquiry into a failed tactical strategy in the, in the Phoenix ATF office around Fast and Furious into a, a bigger discussion about are we doing enough to stop the flow of guns into Mexico? I think the answer is no. I think there's more we can do. Uh, and I hope that we can get more politicians on the side of working with this administration to do common sense things like, for example, this new... Um, a requirement where if you buy two long guns in a five-day period, it, your name has to be reported to the federal government. Those are the kind of common sense things that have to be done if we're going to have a comprehensive strategy to increase trade and also, you know, decrease violence in the border region. And so um, I think we're getting to a better place. I think this is going to be an issue heavily debated in the presidential election next year. Uh, and I think we, we welcome that debate and want to help inform it as it, as it moves along. Eric, Rick, anything you guys want to sure. add Sure. Sure. Thanks, uh, Simon. Uh, a, a couple of things, Jonathan. Uh, our government uh, and Mexico's government have a multi-issue agenda now and have had such an agenda for, for many, many years. 
Uh, Fast and Furious is just one item on that agenda, and it's a long, long list of, 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 of things to do. Uh, we have a long to-do list between the two countries. Uh, I would say that. I would also say that, uh, right, I, I would echo what Simon says about the need for a comprehensive strategy for working with Mexico. We don't have currently one relationship with Mexico. We have a set of relationships uh, with Mexico, and that is a tremendous challenge uh, for both federal governments, uh, getting all of the big, big federal agencies uh, on the same page uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, we're not there yet, and we have a lot of work to do. Rick, any, any comments on that one? All right. All right, I think we have one more question here to throw on the board. Give me a second. Uh, um, one second. Prove it. Here we go. And this one comes from Julio Lanez. As we enter the presidential season, how do you think the border will come into play? Um, who wants to take that one? Well, that would be in, in both countries, right? I mean, I think there's also a Mexican presidential election as well. I'll defer to Rick and, and Eric, Eric on this one. Eric? Uh, Julio, that is a fantastic question. I'm, I'm dying to find out the answer uh, uh, of myself. One thing that we haven't talked about, we, haven't, we don't talk about uh, immigration in our report. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very brief report. Uh, we, it focuses on, on trade. One thing that's, uh, uh, that's flying under a lot of people's radar right now is that immigration from Mexico is close to net zero uh, uh, for the first time in a long, long time. Uh, so, in some ways, uh, political discussion about, about immigration from Mexico and Central America is, uh, sounds to me uh, like uh, it's, it's a little bit out of, it's more than a little bit out of date. So, immigration is at net zero. So, that is one uh, border issue that uh, uh, really shouldn't be an issue, but it, it may be. On the Mexican side, um, the issue, the security situation in the border region is, I would say, it's fluid. We have to wait and see uh, uh, what happens in the major border cities such as Tijuana, uh, uh, Ciudad Juarez, uh, Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez, which are relatively calm right now, uh, as well as places a little bit further in, such as uh, uh, Saltillo and, and Monterrey, uh, which have had uh, spectacular security uh, incidents. In, in Mexico, the situation will remain fluid. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we could have a discussion about uh, a, a problem that really isn't that much of a problem anymore, at, at, at least at this point. I, I just want to add just a, sort of a simple observation, which is that in our election in the U.S. next year, there will be only 12, 13, 14 states that will really be competitive and in play by the two parties. And at least, you know, four of them will be in the border region, right? I mean, if you have Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, and then you add Florida, where there are also a huge percentage of Latino voters. I mean, the Latino vote in, in the border region it, are going to be highly are going to be central to the entire presidential election next year. This is going to be a very close election in all likelihood between the two parties. And so what it means is that it's going to be impossible not to have a big conversation about a rising Latin, Latino population in the U.S., the challenge of the, of the border, the immigration challenge. It's going to be central to the election because four, about a third of the states that are in play are going to 
be in the broader border region. And so I think we should expect a big debate. Uh, I think that, you know, what's interesting is how much this has been a big issue in the Republican primary. I mean, if you look at, you know, it's been a defining issue in many ways, or one of the three or four defining issues that have differentiated you know, Mitt Romney from Rick Perry, increasingly Mitt Romney now from, you know, Newt Gingrich. You've heard, you know, Rick Perry, you know, and I'll say this, I mean, Rick Perry using, uh, you know, because I think he's been accused of being sort of soft uh, on immig immigration because of his support of the Texas Dream Act, you know, he's had very extreme rhetoric, frankly, on, on border issues in Mexico, even calling for an armed invasion of Mexico to go after the cartels. So I think you've already seen this be a big issue. I think we should expect it to be, you know, significantly next year uh, as well. All right. Uh, Chris John, what else you I got? I think we have time. For we got one more question in here. This one, uh, a little more trade and uh, focused. Let me throw that on the board for you, everyone. Um, trade and economic grower and border communities. Um, Eric, Rick, you guys are in Arizona. You guys talk to people a lot who deal with uh, those communities along the border. What do you, either of you want to take this question? Rick, go ahead. All right, Simon. Rick, Simon. Simon, any comments? Look, I think that when the idea of comprehensive immigration reform was introduced in 2005 by John McCain and Ted Kennedy, there were always three components to it. One was to toughen up at the board, on the border and in the workplace. Two was to deal with what we call future flow, which is sort of tweaks in the legal immigration system that would be more responsive to the needs of the economy as it is today. And third is the, the one that's become the most controversial piece, which is to deal with what do we do with the 11 million that are already here. I think what's true as we head into 2012 is that we've made tremendous progress in the first leg of the three-legged immigration school. Uh, you know, we've, there is, the, as uh, Eric said, I mean, there's been net zero migration this year. The amount of illegal migration into the U.S. has dropped precipitously. The administration, I think, has gotten uh, is dealing with business and uh, businesses that exploit work, uh, illegal workers in a much more sensible way than the previous administration and improved that. And I think we've seen, as we discussed, tremendous progress made in border uh, border safety, where the border region is much safer and, and much more intelligent and well-funded policies have been put into place. The debate now, I think, will be about parts two and three, which is, as Rick said, about legal migration and how we want to improve the legal migration system that we have, which is still inadequate for the needs of our 21st century economy, uh, and what do we do with the 11 million that are already here, and I think that's to a great degree where, you know, assuming we can, the, the four of us on this precast can convince everybody else that the border is safer and that progress has been made, you know, that we can, you know, get on with fixing the rest of the immigration system, but I think it's critical as a way to end this talk is that what we have seen in the last two years is that with better strategy, more money, greater cooperation with Mexico, we can make the border region safer. Government can attack and this, this problem and make it better. Uh, we've still got more to do, and I hope that's really what the debate is about and what we all get done together in the coming, in the coming years. Eric, uh, Rick, you guys have any final comments? I, I just wanted to say, Anthony, that uh, I, I just wanted to make the point that on the U.S. side, the border region, with the exception of the San Diego and El Paso uh, uh, areas, is one of the poorer regions of the United States. And so I think your question is, uh, is, a, is a really interesting one. Usually when we talk about immigration as an economic driver to the U.S., we're talking about high-skill immigration. I think going forward, we will need to look at all parts of the economy, uh, our needs in all parts of the economy, and work backwards from there. What is it that we need? What kind of workers do we need for a 21st century economy here in the United States? And work backwards from there. Rick? Any 
No, no, just in general. We're going to take the question away, and Rick, if you have any final thoughts for the audience today, we've uh, got another five minutes here, so feel free. All right, uh, Simon, thank you. You're good, or? Just a final thought is just want to thank Eric and Rick and their whole team. Uh, you know, it's our first time working together with them. It's been a terrific experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, this is an issue for me that is uh, very, as the head of my organization, uh, this is something I, we care about an awful lot here. Uh, we've devoted a tremendous amount of energy and resources into trying to change this conversation. I think, I think frankly, if you really look back at the last year, uh, this year of 2011, it started with a major speech by Janet Napolitano making the case that the border uh, strategy, the strategy we have towards improving the border is working. The president gave a similar speech. Uh, I think, Eric and Rick, we have to acknowledge that the conversation is changing. Uh, we got more to do, but I think we're in a much better place on this uh, and, than we were a year ago. And to me, what's probably the greatest, you know, the greatest sign of that is that trade continues to increase, despite all of the reasons why you might see disinvestment or decreased levels of trade between the two countries because of the perception of violence. You know, this desire to create opportunity for people on both sides of the border, the great human spirit that is trying to make things and get things done is prevailing over all the yabber yabber on cable talk shows. Uh, and I think that the, this report to me is a, is a clear sign uh, of why, uh, you know, regular people are overcoming, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the improper understanding of, of what's happening on the border just through their sheer act of commerce and how it's continuing to explode. One more question. One more question. I just got it. It's a good one. And I just want to give it to Simon real quick. I'm going to throw it up there. Two seconds. Sorry, guys. This is a new platform for us. So I'm very excited about it. It's very cool. Um, Simon, this is a very D.C. Uh, congressional thing. Even if the message of the border is now secure or successful, would immigration reform ever happen without with more border security as a component? And that is the final question. Everything's closed. I just couldn't resist putting it up there. I sort of covered it a little bit earlier, but I, I think it's a great question. I, I think the point is I don't know how much more border security we can add, you know, I mean, I, I think that the whole point is that we've actually implemented and have been implementing the, if you go back and look at the original McCain-Kennedy legislation in 2005, we've actually implemented the border security part of that, right? I mean, comprehensive immigration reform has already been partially implemented uh, by what we've done to go after unscrupulous employers in the U.S. and, and with a much more aggressive and targeted and effective strategy to discourage them from hiring undocumented immigrants, and the way that we've been able to invest, you know, additional funds at a better strategy, more effective strategy, greater crop in Mexico, we've seen progress. So I think that my own take on this, and I think the president echoed this in his speech in El Paso, is that, look, we've demonstrated we can make progress. The comprehensive immigration reform strategy was the right one. We've implemented part one. Now we've got to get to part two and three. By the way, it doesn't mean we stop doing what we're doing. It doesn't mean we take our foot off the gas. I think that part of the way you have to look at that recent DEA story in the New York Times about the money laundering and the Fast and Furious is that this is our government attempting to do more and be more aggressive and to put the, you know, this, is, this administration, there has been an argument by some this administration isn't doing enough. In fact, the stories of DEA and Fast and Furious is showing they may be doing too much, right? It's the exact opposite of what has been accused by many that this has been very forward-leaning, very aggressive, frankly, and with demonstrable and clear positive results. And so I think the story here is not a story, as, as Rick was saying, the glass is half full, not half empty, I, I think, on this broader story. Uh, but I think the next set of things we've got to do, which is fixing the legal immigration system, making it more responsive to our economy, and then dealing with the undocumented is actually going to be, you know, it's still going to be tough. And I think that, you know, I hope that there's a, a thoughtful and serious conversation about this next year. And, you know, I hope that the Republican Party, frankly, shifts and moves in a more responsible place 
in the way that they're dealing with these issues and that the party of Bush and Reagan reasserts itself over the party of Tancredo and, and others that we've seen in recent years. All right. Um, because I am producing the webcast, I'm going to take the last 30 seconds just to sort of address things and then close it out for everybody. Chris well, John, um, Rick. Oh, Rick, did you want to call me? I apologize. Go ahead. Rick, are you good? All right, Eric, any final thoughts? Uh, the, the trade story is a, a really compelling one. And uh, again, uh, uh, Mexico and Canada uh, play a really important part in, uh, in our nation's economy. And uh, if we focus on that 10% more, I think we'll see huge, huge benefits. All right. Uh, I think we're out of time right now. We're at an hour, and I just wanted to thank everybody for being with us today. Um, always a pleasure, and we will be doing these again. Definitely going to be doing these again in the future, hopefully with ASU. NDN certainly will be. And again, check out the 21st Century Border Initiative webpage, 21border.com. I'm going to throw that up on the screen real quick. And again, thank you, Rick. Thank everybody. Uh, you guys have a great day. Thanks, we everybody. are. Thank you. We're done.